Hey guys, it's Alec Torelli, and I got a very special hand of the day for you today. 125,000 in the middle. I'm like, all right, you know, Vegas and the Mirage, right? Next year, turn 21, I'm going. Along with a very cool story that I hope you're going to enjoy. You know, yeah, this right here for Rev. Just to paint the picture, I it was a normal Tuesday afternoon for me at the time. I wasn't old enough to play poker in a casino. So I was in my parents' room uh, sitting and just waiting to, to get action at the high stakes tables on full tilt. And so I turned the volume on my computer up really, really loud so that I get alerted when someone sits down. It does this little beep when you get dealt your cards and someone sits. And I would just sit there. And so I opened the highest stakes uh, games on full tilt and just sat and waited for someone to come. Uh, I turn on the TV. I'm kind of watching a TV show just there with the computer in the background. And I hear the little beep. So like, boom, <laughs> I got action, right? It's like this immediate dopamine hit because you know you got high stakes action. So I find myself playing against a, a guy who I've played many, many times in the past. So I know it's going to be a fun, uh, epic match. He plays any two cards, super crazy. Uh, definitely a big whale in the games back in the day on full tilt. So I find myself up a buy-in really quick, which in, in those games, you're up a buy-in. You know, it's it's a sports car. But I'm not, uh, I'm not celebrating yet because I know things can change in a moment. And that's just the way these matches go. So I get dealt two threes in the big blind. And heads up, threes is a pretty damn good hand. Uh, you're definitely looking to, to flop a set. And I know if I do against this type of player, the, the, the way that we've been playing, very aggressive, a lot of check raising, uh, a lot of bluffing, I know I could win myself a big pot. So he opens the button, pretty standard. I call on the big blind, go heads up to the flop. The flop comes down 7-4-3. I check like I always do. He he bets very often. These this was back in the day where people weren't checking back flops. It's like if you raised preflop, you were c betting. Especially even in a six max game, that would happen. At, at, you know, back in back in the day. But in a heads up game, it's like c betting. C betting was a hundred percent of the time. So I check, of course, and now he bets thirty six hundred into a three k pot. So now I'm like, okay, he definitely has something. 743 rainbow, he's probably protecting with a big hand. He probably has an overpair. And I, I had played with him many times in the past and had a read that this was likely to be a very strong hand that he just wanted to protect against. He didn't want to let me draw for cheap. So now I think he has an overpair and the clear play is to check raise. He's never going to fold an overpair. Certainly not to me, certainly not heads up in this game. So he bets 3,600. I make it 11,200 and he calls. And now I know he's got an overpair because if he was bluffing somehow or had some weak hand, he's never going to call my raise. So when he calls my raise on the flop, I know he has it. Turn comes down to queen. And now I'm like, okay, I just bet out big, hope he calls or jams. And no matter what, I'm going to get all the money in by the river. Easy game, right? I bet out two thirds pot and he jams, got a set. I'm like, boom, call it off. So I call cards returns face up and he's got two jacks. So one card left to come. I have a set against an overpair, or not an overpair, but a set against you know a pair. I'm 95% to win. 125,000 in the middle. I'm like, all right, you know, Vegas and the Mirage, right? Next year, turn 21, I'm going. Boom. The river comes a jack. And although that hand was played back in 2007, it really seems like yesterday. And like I could still feel the numbness I experienced afterwards. Maybe it's because like the defense mechanism, you know, shield me from fully comprehending what happened. But I literally just sat there for a moment with my mouth open, just not able to breathe. But the game had to go on. Like just as quickly as the river card came, the next hand began. And as I had practiced so many times for preparations and moments like these, I just repeated the words next hand and the game just went on. This is what's called a bad beat in poker. <laughs> I've thought about that hand many times since that afternoon. Sometimes I replay it in my mind. And despite that painful loss, I really can't say I would do anything different. I did what I was supposed to do. I just went all in when I was a big favorite, but it was just unfortunate that I lost the pot. So playing the odds and betting when you have a strong hand are what card sharks live by. They trust that in the end, if one continues to put their money in with the best of it, that they'll come out on top. They also know that math is really only part of the equation. As most prof professional risk takers, from poker players to stock traders or whoever, will tell you, the most important habit is capital management. 
Everyone has their favorite story of a rising star or some guy with incredible talent that never reached his full potential because he couldn't manage his money correctly and therefore he went broke. Properly allocating capital is what allowed me to turn lemons into lemonade. While I did lose that one hand, I kept enough in reserve to rebuy in case I got unlucky. So I was prepared for something like this. And as my opponent and I played more hands, the luck evened out and my skill edge came to fruition and I won. On any given hand, any amateur with any two cards can win, but in the long run, nobody defies the odds. This truth is what helped coin the adage, the house always wins, because in the end, they always do. Proper risk management supersedes any tactical skill in many ways, because without managing one's money correctly, your results are too heavily based on luck. In other words, it's the foundational decision of how to allocate capital that paves the way for the talented player to win in the long term. In my hand with those pocket threes, taking the calculated risk was predicated on the fact that I could afford to be in the game in the first place. That is to say I could plan on taking a bad beat by not risking too much of my bankroll in any one hand, knowing that if I lost, I could just buy in again. Now imagine if I couldn't rebuy because my entire poker bankroll was on the line. Would it have still been the right move to play the hand that way? Most definitely, I had 95% chance of winning. But one could easily argue I should never have been in the game to, to begin with. So what if not only my entire bankroll was on the line, but my poker career as well? So such was the predicament that Michael Jordan found himself in after his first year with the Chicago Bulls. After coming down hard on his left foot during the third game of the 85-86 NBA season, a series of x-rays confirmed he had broken his left navicular tarsal, a small bone in the foot which can be difficult to heal due to lack of blood flow. The healing time can vary from six weeks, 12 weeks, or even longer, and occasionally that fracture does not heal. Jordan, who had never missed a single game since his days at Laney High School, was forced to sit it out. He grew irritable and anxious, and he finally convinced the Bulls to let him return to UNC, where he practiced in secret, playing up to an hour and a half per day. He eventually confessed this to the Bulls' management, stating he believed he was ready to return to the game. But before a decision was made, Jerry Reinsdorf, the Bulls' owner, along with Jerry Krause, the Bulls' general manager, consulted the experts. Michael asked him, well, if I play, what percentage is there that I'm going to get hurt again? Doctor said, yeah, 10%. Jordan, with the odds in his favor, was optimistic. I said, look, it's 10% chance, but it's 90% chance that I won't. But it was Reinsdorf who asked the real question. What happens if the 10% kicks in? And they said, well, then his career would be over. In my mind, he should not risk coming back because we weren't going to win a championship anyway. Why even take a 10% risk? that your career is going to be over. Well, he didn't see it that way. I agree with the owner's perspective here. The risks don't seem to justify the reward. Not only did Jordan have his entire career in front of him, but the Bulls were hardly in a position to make the playoffs, let alone win a championship. Why take a 10% career-ending risk for Jordan and a franchise-ending risk for the, for the Bulls when Jordan's foot could fully heal in the offseason and he could return next year and play at 100% capacity with maybe no risk for re-injury. Wow, everybody's just thinking about the negative. Well, I think the, the glass is half full, everybody thinks it's half empty. Jordan, the legend that he was, continued to see the glass half full. One of the things I loved about watching The Last Dance was just his mindset. He was really a winner at all costs, and it, it's part of what made him a champion. Despite his perseverance, uh, Krauss, Reinsdorf, and the doctors tried to sway him to sit out. In one last effort, Reinsdorf posed a very interesting hypothetical. Here's what he said. So I said to Michael, you don't, you're not understanding the risk reward ratio. If you had a terrible headache and I gave you a bottle of pills and nine of the pills would cure you and one of the pills would kill you, would you take a pill? Depends on how fucking bad the headache is. Jordan took the pill. Had Jordan instead remained on the bench for the remainder of the season, it's really probable that the Bulls wouldn't have even qualified for the playoffs and actually would have gained a higher pick in the draft the next year. This would have put the Bulls franchise in a better position to win a future championship, all while avoiding a potential catastrophe if Jordan took that bad beat and suffered a career-ending injury.
Jordan didn't see it that way though. His motivation was to play each and every game to win at all costs, and it's a very commendable attitude and unequivocally part of his legacy. It's true that Jordan was a big favorite for everything to go his way. He was betting when the odds were in his favor. He had a 90% chance that things would be fine, he'd return to basketball, and he would play as normal and nothing would ever happen. But one key distinction between playing a hand of poker and a career-altering decision like Jordan's is that in poker, one could always rebuy. There's always another hand. There's always another game. I mean, provided that one manages their money correctly. But for MJ, he truly redefined what it meant to be all in. When I was watching The Last Dance, I couldn't help but wonder if Jordan's decision to risk it all was the right one. While I trust that Jordan knew best about what his body could handle, one must also accept that there was an element of uncertainty, just like what there is when you move all in at the table and wait for that final card to come. You just don't know what it's going to bring. Even if he felt he was ready, Jordan couldn't definitively prevent landing oddly on his foot and suffering a career-ending injury. Poker has taught me that one doesn't play the game with money that they simply can't afford to lose. And seeing how easy it is to take bad beats has helped me better assess risk and avoid taking them when I'm unwilling to accept the potential outcome. If I were in Jordan's shoes, I don't think I would have gone all in here as the consequences of losing the hand are just far too great. It's one of those things where, yes, it's only 10% to happen, but if that 10% does strike, it's game over. And the opportunity is just waiting one more year. You're in your young 20s, you have a 10 year career ahead of you. So I just think that it's a situation where the reward of playing and squeaking by in the playoffs doesn't justify the risk of having a career ending injury. Most would argue that history proved Jordan right, especially after his epic performance against the Celtics. Tragically instead got injured after returning to play, I wonder, would it still be regarded as the correct decision to return to the court? To do so would be akin to saying that going all in with my pocket threes was incorrect just because I had lost the hand. So poker teaches one to judge the play based on the merit of the decision, based on the expectation, and not based on the outcome. So the difference between playing poker where you are bankrolled for a game, in situations like this where it's you could only play the hand one time, is that in the former, you can be more aggressive. You can be more liberal with the risks you take because you can rebuy. So the decision to take a risk in the first place is a wise one. It's a profitable one, not because the situation in a vacuum is profitable, but because you can support the risk you're taking by taking subsequent risks where you're still profitable. So that's why the house always wins, because they can play the game multiple times. But what happens when you're only playing the game once? When you could only run it once? Well, you have to be much, much more cautious, especially in situations when the outcome is something that you cannot afford. So if it's a game of life and, life and death, like Reinsdorf posed to Jordan, you can't, you can't play the game. You can't play Russian roulette even if there's millions of dollars to win when you don't get shot in the head because the one time you get shot, you're dead. You can't afford to play the game. That's how I kind of view risk reward. And I feel like poker really helps you assess these things because you see that these unlikely situations happen all the time because you constantly take bad beats. And so you realize that you have to manage your money correctly. In fact, it's why people say it's one of the most important skills of a poker player, because you can be the best player in the world, but if you don't manage your money, you will go broke. Jordan only got to run this once, but I really wonder, would people have viewed it as the right decision if he took a bad beat and a career ending injury? I mean, it would be crazy to think we would never know the greatest player of all time. He would just be added to a list of players that never reached their full potential because they got injured somewhere along the way. In order to reach the top, in order to become the GOAT, of course you have to play your cards well, and of course Jordan deserves all of his success. He was the greatest of all time. But in, in any situation, to reach a certain level, not only do you have to play your cards right, but they also have to fall your way. You have to avoid taking these bad beats because they could happen. 
and there is luck involved and there are outcomes we can't control. So all we can do is choose which cards to play and choose how we play the hand. We can't control the hand we're dealt. And if you do reach the top or in anything in life, you just need the cards to fall your way some of the time. For Jordan, it definitely happened. I hope you enjoyed this video. I'd love your thoughts in a comment below. Should, is it a risk he should have taken or was it too much of a gamble? Uh, if you like this video, I'd appreciate a like and you subscribe to the channel. That lets me know that I'm putting out content you like. Uh, thanks for watching. Thanks for your time and attention. I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.